Good afternoon and thanks for joining the webinar this afternoon. My name is Jacob Powell. I'm a general agricultural extension agent for OSU Extension Service in Wasco and Sherman counties. And I'm joined this afternoon with Katie Wolstein, the rangeland fire extension specialist for OSU. And the goal of this webinar this afternoon, I'm gonna start off going over ways that we can mitigate wildfire risk through grazing and also briefly how we can conduct the wildfire inventory on our properties. And then Katie Wolstein will discuss the uh, social barriers to using grazing as an effective tool on federal rangelands. So to get started on this slide here, I do have an online folder that we'll mention a few times here that will have some additional resources available after this webinar, including today's slides as well. So there's a link for that there. And thinking about reducing wildfire risk through grazing, kind of putting this in more of a historical context, if we think back, you know, especially across the, the Great Plains, you know that historically there were large fires that occurred that were started from lightning and Native Americans also set their own prescribed fires as well. So we had a very fast combustion of fuels out there on the landscape through fire. And then there's also this very slow combustion of these large ungulate herds, uh, such as uh, buffalo. There were larger herds of elk. And so we had a really slow combustion removal of fuels from the landscape from the herbivore standpoint as well. And then when European settlers arrived, we kind of had a decoupling of these two very natural processes that used to occur in the, in the past. And so it's kind of double whammy that we disrupted the the natural grazing regimes on the landscape. And then at the same time, we were putting out fires that were occurring as well. And so suddenly we had a large increase in fuels on the landscape. And also in other areas, we had removal of fuels, but with fences and domesticated livestock, suddenly we were not evenly grazing everything. You know, we had areas that were extremely overgrazed and areas that were undergrazed and were still being a wildfire risk. And so now fast forward to the 20th century where it's an issue that we're dealing with and trying to figure out how can we recouple these and to help deal and mitigate with the wildfire issue that we're now having in Oregon. And just a reminder that in the past, Native Americans used to graze across the mid Columbia region here in North Central Oregon that Tenaino and Wyam tribes in Truman Wasco counties had a lot of horses, tens of thousands of horses. Um, you know, also down in Warm Springs, they had a lot of horses as well. And so these, these horses, they had uh, spread out across the landscape. They were not using fences for the most part. So they had a very even distribution and they had a lot of animals on the landscape, but since they were able to move them frequently, they were not doing any damage to the bunch grasses that were present. And overall, fairly healthy bunch grass community and they definitely had areas that they were grazing effectively that reduced the chance of large catastrophic wildfires from occurring. And so a big part of this webinar today is, you know, it's unfortunately I wish it was as simple as just simply building a fence to stop a wildfire. We definitely see that grazing can reduce the fuel load and structure on the landscape, allowing fires to naturally go out on their own or often allow firefighters and folks with suppression to get involved with the fire in areas that have been grazed. So I'm going to talk about the usefulness of grazing, provide some examples, but also try to put it in perspective that there are a lot of challenges with using this as an effective tool to make sure that we're not actually creating more problems than solving problems out there on the landscape. So now we've got a very short video here talking about the we value of grazing. From a rancher over towards Santa Paul and he said, hey, a fire just started over by St. Thomas Aquinas College. And that fire come down that canyon like a cyclone, spinning from side of the canyon to side of the canyon. 80, 85 mile an hour winds. About that time, the embers started coming. And I mean, it was an ember shower like I've never seen before. Embers the size of your thumb were just flying, landing in the pocket of your coat, lighting your coat pocket on fire. 600 bales of hay on one side of the light caught on fire at once. 
and we really had a mess going. And for about 10 hours, we stayed there and fought that fire. We never saw anything like that in our whole life, a fire of that kind of intensity and that kind of burning. And, and uh, thank God for the grazing that we did around the house and around the office, because the office is just a half a mile below the house. And we didn't have the resources to fight the fire at the office and the house. But the grazing we did around the office, it saved the office just naturally. 500 houses to the east of that area that hadn't been grazed in 30 years, almost completely burned to the ground that neighborhood. And 500 people lost their homes. Across the rest of the ranch, we managed all the way across the rest of Ventura. Yeah, there were some homes that burned down from embers, but 95% of the homes that burned down were because of the pastures that weren't grazed. And a lot of, most all the homes adjacent to the pastures that were grazed were saved. So I can't preach anything more to my urban neighbors the fact that grazing is what helps protect you. Because uh, without us, this vegetation would have been four times as thick and the damage would have been four times as bad. So I'm working on my screen share here, but that uh, some solar video really illustrates the use of, of grazing and how it can be an effective tool to use out there. I apologize, but my slideshow is stuck here. Okay, back up and running on the slideshow here. But that video, video is from Ventura County, California, where obviously there are areas that are very uh, heavily populated. And so that gentleman there with his cattle ranch, they were able to graze successfully around their property when this fire came through. And, you know, it was definitely a battle that they were there for several, for 10 hours putting the fire out. But because of the grazing that they did, they were able to actually effectively engage with that fire. They did not have to evacuate. And Similarly, he even said that, you know, they didn't have the resources to necessarily fight the fire on all their property, but because of the grazing they did, they were able to focus on those areas that really needed attention and those other areas naturally survived without them having to do a bunch of extra defensible work. So why bother grazing with, with fire? Obviously, we know that grazing is going to reduce the amount of fuel that's on the landscape. It's going to change the structure of that fine fuel so that it's gonna be easier for us to engage when we do have a fire. And in many cases, it can also increase the fuel moisture in those grazed areas. So the fire is gonna go out much quicker, or have much more laid back fire behavior. And as that gentleman was just showing, you know, grazing definitely can slow down fires. In some cases it can turn or stop a wildfire. But we have to remember that uh, fire weather plays a critical role in this as well, that we can graze an area, but we have extreme fire behavior, fire weather, we're still gonna have a lot of fire going through that area, but hopefully it'll be more relaxed than the surrounding areas that have not been grazed. So there's really two main approaches in terms of how we use grazing on the landscape for fire. There's one that we use at a very broad landscape scale that you're just trying to use heavier grazing in certain pastures at different times of the year to get a better outcome on those fields. Likewise, we can really focus on targeted strips along roadways or other areas on the farm or ranch that is going to act as a fuel break in those areas. And so it's also important to remember that if your focus on grazing is purely for fuel reduction, we need to focus those in areas that firefighters are actually going to be able to be at in areas that are close to infrastructure that we care about. Uh, likely, you're not going to be able to effectively manage for fuel reduction on all of your pastures, but you can strategize and prioritize areas that you know firefighters have access to. So areas that are close to roads are a good place to start. And areas that are around your farm, your office, some of the, the farm infrastructure versus areas that are far out from the ranch that there are not as many resources of concern. So this picture here, you can see the red line here that there's a fence at the top of this ridge. This is a photo in Wasco County. It's just showing an area that uh, has been grazed. This picture was taken in September, but it was grazed in the early to late spring, the, the spring before. And you can see on the right-hand side, on the other side of the fence line, just how much 
all the grass fuel that you can see up there, a lot of that is annual grass fuels are still left up there. They've been up there through the whole fire season. And you can see on the graze area here just how well they remove those annual grasses. And this picture doesn't illustrate it, but I know from talking with the producer who, who uh, grazes this area and being up there myself during the growing season that they were not harming uh, the native perennials up there. It's really, it's just the annual grasses that were removed that are and are the primary uh, fire hazard in those areas. It's also important to remember that we want to remove fuels to reduce wildfire behavior, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to cause uh, pasture degradation or graze those perennials or preferred grasses so hard that uh, nothing's going to come back and it's not going to be a sustainable operation for us. And so this fence line is actually pretty close to where that other photo was that I just showed you. And you can just see the difference that on one side, you're not going to have a fire, but it also looks like a feedlot that you're not going to have very healthy vegetation coming back. Another concern too is when we really overgraze like this pasture on the left, the perennials don't stand a chance coming back in, but there's a good chance cheatgrass and other annual grasses are going to be able to successfully colonize those areas, especially such a, a high loading of livestock dung that you can see in the fence here. A lot of those annual grasses really thrive when you give them some added nitrogen, like you can see here, and those perennials just aren't as, cannot access those added nutrients as quickly or as effectively. And so that's really those annuals are going to take off most likely. So a lot of this is, is where do we find a balance between grazing too hard for fire protection and not grazing enough? The other question is, so we're talking about grazing, uh, what type of tools do you want to use? And so a big of it, big question is what livestock do you want to use? And a lot of that depends on what type of forage you're trying to remove. For a lot of the annual grasses, perennials, primarily with grasses, you know, you're looking at cattle or horses to remove that vegetation. Sheep can do a good job with grasses. Sheep will also do forbs in some shrubs. And then if you're using goats, just remember that they're really going to go after those shrubs and vines and brush first and then get to the grasses. So but if you have shrubs and brush that you care about, the goats are going to clean those out and then finally get to the grass that you're actually concerned about for fire removal. So just keep that in mind. And if you're really trying to get aggressive, you have to remember that when cattle take a bite out of those grasses, they're wrapping their tongue around the base of the plant to eat it. So the shorter that that vegetation gets, the harder it's going to be for them to wrap their tongue around and actually be able to graze it effectively. So if you're really trying to get it short, um, sheep and horses are a better option to reduce that. But if you're in an area that you're trying to conserve some of the, the native vegetation, uh, horses and sheep can also graze them uh, overly aggressively and leave you with, with not enough to come back in the future. The other thing to consider with what sort of tool you're going to use is where you're trying to do it at. For the most part, cattle can graze some pretty steep slopes. That can sometimes depend on the breed of cow that you're using and if they're genetically used to grazing steep slopes. This picture here is actually of a dam in Hepner, Oregon. And every year they actually bring these goats in to do some targeted grazing to remove this vegetation that's growing uh, on the, the face of the dam here. And so it's, it's pretty impressive what goats are able to do. That if uh, slopes are a concern, goats definitely are a good resource to use. So several considerations for how we manage grazing in general, if we're trying to be sustainable on the landscape or if we're trying to reduce wildfire risk. You know, first off, the biggest thing is the time. How long are we going to leave those livestock in there to remove that forage? So there's several different types of grazing systems and different concepts of how long we want to leave those animals in there. So I mentioned just a few here, but you know, you can have continuous that maybe you're leaving livestock in the pasture for a full year. Maybe you're doing more of a rotation schedule that they graze that pasture for a month and then you rotate them onto another pasture. And the time can really depend on the number of animals that you have and the size of the pasture and what your goals are. You know, typically duration can be uh, months to weeks. And in some cases, if we really talk about high stock density, if you really cram the animals in there, they're going to remove all the forage fairly quickly. And so it might just be a matter of hours before you're moving them to another pasture in those situations. Other question is, what time of year are we going to put the livestock in there to graze? The biggest difference is this there's dormant or growing season. And when we're thinking about wildfire risk reduction, often with 
fuel. So we want to get them removed before the fire season that year, obviously. And so in that case, we're kind of looking at dormant season grazing, basically in the fall or into the winter months. And then typically, you know, by May, May or the start of June, we're going to have the cows out of that pasture because we're hoping that by then the fuels are going to be low enough for fire season that we're not going to have fuels that carry. And as a result, there's not going to be much vegetation left for the cows to eat in that particular location at that time anymore. When we're thinking about timing with grazing for wildfire risk, the biggest thing to think about is what sort of grasses and vegetation do we have present? If you have a really healthy perennial vegetation plant community that you've got good bunch grasses, you don't have too many invasive plants like cheatgrass, you're really going to want to focus on more of a dormant season grazing because if you're in there heavily grazing those perennials when they're actively growing in the spring, there's a good chance that you're going to graze them too short and you're going to have issues that the plant community is going to start um, fading and you're going to have an increase in invasive grasses and an increase in your shrub component potentially if you graze too hard in the growing season. But likewise, if you have invasive annuals that you're concerned about, often growing them in the um, early to late spring at the start of the growing season, that's a good time of year to graze them, graze them hard and hopefully wear them out in the future that you can have an increased chance of uh, seeding in more successful vegetation in the, in the future, hopefully. The other thing to consider there is, you know, I'm saying growing season, but often we want to graze those before they go to seed set. Often just simply that once they go to seed set, they'll be more on, they'll be less palatable to the livestock and to consume. And so they might potentially be grazing other things we don't want them grazing. If we're really concerned about that fine fuel load, you really want to have those grazed before seed set happens. And so, you know, North Central Oregon, that would be probably want to have those areas grazed by the end of May. But in other areas, you know, down by Burns, other areas that are higher elevation, uh, later season plants, you know, you could be looking at, at grazing those into, into June, towards the end of June, and then July, you would maybe want to transfer, transfer them out to different location. The other question is the intensity. How much forage are we actually removing? Um, at the most basic level, this is measured in pounds of biomass per acre. How many pounds of forage are those livestock removing from the landscape? And this can also be determined by stocking rate. Uh, the stubble height is also a good indicator. I'll provide some examples in this webinar, but it was really a struggle for me that when you're thinking about more intensive grazing or grazing, you know, you're not just simply trying to graze for the animal speed there. You're trying to set a stocking rate that's going to remove invasive annuals or you're trying to remove fuels for wildfire risk reduction. Suddenly there's less information out there about you know, how many animal units or AUMs you're supposed to be using per acre and stuff like that. And a lot of that is because these more adaptive grazing systems, they require an increased intensity on our part as the manager and that we have to do a lot more monitoring on what the vegetation is actually doing. And so with wildfire risk reduction, often people use a ballpark number of, you know, you need your stubble heights to be two inches or shorter if you're trying to do a fuel break. And in some cases that's easy to obtain. In other cases, you're gonna need a lot of animals to do that. And you might be sacrificing animal health as a result of trying to get your stubble height so low. So a lot of this intensity, a lot of it is being intensive as a manager, determining where that plant community is and seeing when that soil height gets low enough, knowing that you need to quickly move them to another pasture. And one other resource here, this is a, a guide that came out for livestock producers to think about how to better remove annual grasses. And so I'm gonna focus here on the right-hand side with the, the columns here that considerations to think about Again, the timing that I mentioned, timing it being time of year, that should be based off of not calendar dates, but what the plants are actually looking like. You know, are they seeded out already or are they just going to boot in a, still in a very palatable and nutritious state for livestock to use? Thinking about intensity, if you're trying to remove a lot of biomass, you're gonna increase that intensity, but if you've got a native, healthy native perennial community that you're concerned about, you're gonna to wanna to be careful with your intensity. The other component I didn't talk about earlier is frequency. How often are we coming back to those pastures to regraze them? 
So if we're trying to deal with annual grasses, often as a ballpark, people suggest, you know, you graze the area hard for two weeks, give it a week break, and then come back and give it one last uh, grazing to really help wear those plants down. But if you've got perennials you're concerned about, again, your frequency, you're going to be careful about how often you go back in that pasture, make sure it's fully recovered. Palatability. Again, like I said, often these annual grasses, once they get seed set, they won't be as nutritious. And some of that depends on what those livestock have learned in the past. Uh, there are some producers in different areas that it, the cattle will continue to graze the cheatgrass even once seed set has occurred. But a lot of that will depend on your unique situation. So keep that in mind. Uh, stocking rate, how many animals do you have in there at once? And then, like I said, you know, what, sort of, what class of livestock do you want to use on these projects? So I'm saying here uh, on the left that stocking rate is key. And the question is often we're thinking about short duration grazing for fire, for fuels reduction and removal. So the question is, you know, how short is that? And so I've seen, you know, different things of people primarily for the most part, you know, livestock are either in there for a day, maybe a few hours or potentially for a couple of weeks. So there's one study here that I'll mention that they essentially had 83 cow-calf pairs on 2.5 acres. And they were only in there, you know, for basically two days, you know, averages out to having about 33 cows per acre. And so a lot of this, you know, you can have some areas, people have used high intensity stock grazing and they literally have 500 cows per acre, which is pretty hard for me to fathom. But it's easier to fathom when you realize that they only have those cows on that acre for two or three hours and then they're moving to the, to the next pasture. So this was an interesting study that I'm just referring to here that in California, University of California Extension did a study of just how much fuel do cattle in the state of California remove in a year. So they were primary, they were looking at the year of 2017. So first off, they went out and determined that, okay, we almost have 2 million cattle total that are grazing in California in 2017. And then they were able to extrapolate from several different data sources that they estimated they almost had 12 billion pounds of biomass consumed in that one year. And so 12 billion does seem like a pretty impressive number. That that's a lot of, a lot of forage that those livestock are removing. And you have to remember, compared to the state of Oregon here in California, they have more annual grasses. It's a much uh, drier climate. And so they've been using livestock for quite a while to reduce wildfire risk, particularly in some surprisingly urban areas as well. So this chart here is really illustrating just the diversity of how much fuel is removed per acre in the state. And so, you know, across their study, they had an average of about 600 pounds of forage being removed per acre in 2017. And this plot here is showing just the large diversity, you know, one area they had 174 pounds removed, in other areas they had over a thousand pounds. And so as you can see, these are from different parts of the state. If you go to the Southeast interior where the only 174 pounds was removed, that makes sense It's a very dry climate, not as productive as say the Sierras where you have a lot of higher elevation forages available that are really high in production. And so just interesting diversity there, but impressive how much pounds of forage per acre livestock are capable of removing. So the other point of the studies, they came out and said, okay, we're removing all this biomass, great. But really from a fire perspective, the amount of residual matter that's left on the ground is really what we're concerned about. So this picture here is showing on the left what a pasture looks like when you have only 500 pounds per acre left. And you can see there's a, kind of a thatch layer, not a lot of standing material there. Versus the other extreme, if we have 3,000 pounds to the acre, you have a lot more material there that's going to potentially carry in a fire. And so this scary chart here is showing, you know, just what, how does that residual biomass interact with fire behavior on the landscape? And each of these different lines here are representing different amounts of residual biomass left in the field. And it's being plotted with increasing wind speed and miles per hour on the horizontal axis. 
on the vertical axis we have access we have the flame length that's being created as a result and so the red line here that i've highlighted that's 1200 pounds to the acre and you can see that for the most part at the the um excuse me this red line red line is representing what a four foot flame length would be and then right below this is if we had 1200 pounds of forage left on the landscape we can see that you know with wind speed it interacts a little bit that once between zero and five the flame height is reduced a little bit but once we get over five miles per hour we stay at a consistent flame length of just under four feet at 1200 pounds so you'll hear me reference to this a couple of times throughout this presentation that in the firefighting world basically if you have flame lengths that are four feet or less that allows the wildland firefighters to easily get in there and engage with the fire using water that they're providing from engines and hand tools that they're using to put in line when we have flame lengths over four feet it requires a much less uh, direct approach that's when the firefighters are going to be building a large box fire break essentially to help contain that and they're not going to be able to be directly interacting with the flames and so if we can keep those flame lengths under four feet it allows increased safety for first responders and allows them to get in and put the fire out more effectively and efficiently in areas that often they wouldn't usually be able to get in and fight the fire. And so th this model extra extrapolation that they did is showing that as long as we're keeping fuels under 1200 pounds to the acre, there's a good chance we're dramatically reducing flame fire behavior and we can do a good job of mitigating those risks. The other thing that they also found in their study was that for fine fuels and animal grasses, often we need to be grazing those down to 800 pounds to the acre actually, because of the increased fire behavior that those fine fuels create. So 1200 pounds is, is a ballpark, but really in that, a lot of areas we need to be grazing it down to 800 pounds to the acre or less. So looking at a few studies that have looked at dormant season um, a dormant season grazing to reduce wildfire risk. This is a study that was done down in Burns. And you have to remember uh, Burns compared to other parts of the state of Oregon here is at 4,500 feet elevation. So it's, it's a, things mature there later in the season than they do down here. And so they were looking at can grazing during the winter time, November through March, reduce uh, fuel cover on the landscape. And so on the left here, you can see just excuse me, on the right here, you can see some basic grazing logistics that they were using in the study. This is dormant season grazing, so they had to supplement cattle every other day with alfalfa hay to keep their protein levels up high enough that they would actually consume forage. Big component is when we're doing dormant season grazing, the livestock, their rumen, still need microbes to digest that forage, and so if we just let them consume that really dry, decadent looking vegetation that's low in protein, the rumen's not going to have enough protein for the microbes to actually break forage down. And in fact, they will start consuming less material. So if our goal is really to have them vacuum up those annual grasses for us, we need to have good protein supplementation so that the rumen is happy and they will continue to have a high intake rate. And these cattle were rotated through different pastures. And in general, they had they didn't weren't really using a set stocking rate, but they were using more of a visual estimation of when. The forage was utilized to 40 to 6%, they would then rotate them to the next pasture. And so what they found in this dormant season grazing, they were able to successfully reduce herbaceous fuel cover, biomass, height, and continuity. Uh, they were reducing bunch grass cover by 60%, which if, if this was during the growing season, this would be a huge red flag that you would not want to remove this much bunch grass cover. But since this is in the dormant season, those bunch grasses are not growing and so they're not hurting those growing points on those plants. So this is one picture that was kind of the area that they did their study on. You can see just how much residual fuel is left in the not grazed spot versus winter grazed. And these are the bunch grasses I'm referring to. So you can see the ungrazed plants have a lot of dead residual matter on them versus the grazed plants. They only have the healthy growing points showing. And so by going in there in the winter time, they can effectively remove this thatch layer and this dead material without actually hurting the growing points on the grasses there. 
So, you know, they estimate basically three times the fuel load as grazed areas. And you can see these, by removing that thatch layer, actually allowing more light to get to those plants in the meristems, the growing points. And so you actually have a much happier plant after that. The very interesting part that they found in this study too is that they were measuring uh, fuel moisture in the vegetation that was grazed versus ungrazed. And so this graph here is showing a percent fuel moisture on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is showing the month of the year. And like I referred to later earlier, this is at 4,500 feet. So that's why in July, their winter grazed area had some surprisingly high fuel moisture levels. Uh, way up here. And then you can see it, it, it declines. But you know, it's very striking that you compare that to ungrazed areas they are down here at 20%. And they stay, you know, fairly close to 20% and then drop off as it gets later in the fire season in September. The other thing to point out is that this red line is illustrating that the fuel moisture percentage at 20%. When you have fuel moisture above that, often the fire is not going to carry. But when you have fuel moisture below that, that's when you're going to have some fire behavior that's going to occur. So we can see by doing dormant season grazing, they extended that fuel moisture and kept it higher through September, almost through the end of the fire season. And so at the very end here, the fuel moisture was below 20%, but they were able to basically kind of extend their safety net through the fire season all the way into September. And often around here, hopefully by September, we're getting some rain that's going to help increase fuel moisture as well and decrease wildfire risk. And the other the picture here with the cow is just illustrating that when you think about having a green lawn, often a component is that we're going in there, we're, we're mowing it at a, a frequency of every couple of weeks, and that, that is actually keeping the grass growing by us coming in there mowing. So it's the same thing with grazing, that by removing that biomass, often we're encouraging that plant community to see more of a, a growing vegetative state that's going to have fire, higher moistures than if we just let it sit there. So the same study that was done in Burns, they took the same study and then basically in uh, late September after they took that final, final fuel moisture, they went in and actually lit those plots on fire under some pretty extreme fire conditions, which is great that they were able to do in a realistic standpoint. Uh, but you know the relative humidity was you know below 20% temperatures often in the 80s on some of the days that these, they did these burns are very realistic to actual wildfire happening. And so when they burned these plots, they found that those winter grazed plots, they didn't have, in fact, have reduced flame height. The rate of spread was dramatically reduced and the overall area burned in those plots was reduced. So it's really great that then they were able to apply this and show that in fact, fire behavior was relaxed as a result of this dormant season grazing. So these graphs here, we have flame depth in this illustration of just what flame depth actually is. So it's not flame height, it's how, how wide the flame is on the ground, essentially. And you have flame depth in meters here. So again, we're gonna have to convert to feet here, but they've got grazed and ungrazed. You can see the grazed areas in black, uh, the flame depth, uh, it was below one meter here. So that, you know, below uh, three feet, essentially. And then, like I said, we, we like to see flame heights that are below four feet. And so you can see flame height here on the right, and you can see that sure enough, those grazed areas, you know, it's less than three feet, those flame heights. And so showing that by dormant season grazing, we're really impacting that fire behavior on the ground compared to ungrazed areas. Another study to quickly reference, this was done in northern Nevada back in 2009. These plots were grazed when the cheatgrass was in the boot stage in, in May. And often, you know, this study was also done at basically 4,500 feet. So if you're in other, uh, other areas in Oregon across the Pacific Northwest, often when you see grazed in May, we would probably be thinking more like late April into early May in our particular area. And so they found that by grazing that cheatgrass a lot in this area, was, they didn't have as many bunch grasses and, and burns. They had a lot more cheatgrass. And so they found that, you know, 80 to 90% of that standing cheatgrass biomass was removed. And then some of the others say that they went through and actually burned those plots as well in October. So this is a flame length, how, how long those flames were on the vertical axis, horizontal axis is distance inside the treatment. So you can see at negative 30 feet, they're not in the treatment. That's why they're having uh, more extreme fire behavior. 
versus once that, that fire that they lit, once they watched it actually go into the treatment area, you can see that quickly those grazed areas, grazed areas being in gray versus black being non-grazed, you can see that the flame height dramatically was reduced. And again, like I said, all of this being below three feet, creating a, a safety zone that firefighters could go in and suppress the fire effectively. And then rate of spread. This is in feet per minute. And so again, similarly, once you go inside that treatment, you're starting to see differences. The differences are not as uh, large as just simply flame height, but we can see that those grazed areas overall were having lower rates of spread. It is interesting, 15 feet inside the treatment, and the grazed area actually had slightly greater rate of spread, but that could have been influenced by the surrounding vegetation that the fire was initially lit in. Um, you know, 30 feet within, you can see that grazed area really is not traveling that much. So by decreasing rate of spread, you're also increasing safety out there as well. So other considerations, again, this last day I referenced to, they were small scale plots. They were just grazed uh, for a day or two. And this is a study that the equivalent stocking rate is basically 83 cow-calf pairs for 2.5 acres. Another thing with grazing for fuel reduction, a lot of these annual grasses have extreme variability year from year. And so the second year they had a much greater cheatgrass crop that they actually go, had to go in and graze it twice. And so just remember that grazing is an effective tool, but sometimes you have to be very adaptive with what mother nature hands us as well. The other consideration is that grazing works great, but in areas that we have a lot of shrub component, we're gonna be limited in what we can and can't do. And so this is showing a flame height plotted with shrub cover. This is a study that Chris Schneister did here in Oregon. And these, uh, the burning and grazing that he did were actually conducted over near, Bur near uh, Boise, Idaho. And so what you can see these different lines, we have areas that were no grazed, plotted against a shrub cover. And you can see basically once shrub cover gets to about 20%, we see a, a fairly large spike in flame heights. But we can see by grazing those areas that had shrub cover of 20% or less, but we effectively were decreasing the flame heights and maintaining those below four feet. So again, that four feet number allowing us to get in there and suppress the fire on the ground much more effectively. So it's a very effective tool to use, but again, if you have shrub cover that starts getting to 20, 25%, it's not gonna be as effective. And this scary chart here is just simply showing that, um, showing the limitations of, of grazing as a tool. That when we have a lot of herbaceous fuels to graze, it's effective, not as effective with sagebrush fuels. And likewise, like I said, if we have extreme weather conditions, often the fire is still gonna carry in those areas, though we could have decreased fire behavior even under extreme fire weather conditions. One more picture here, just showing uh, grazed versus not grazed. And it's striking to me here, the picture on the, the right, grazed before uh, fire there. You can see all the stalks of the sagebrush standing up showing there's a very hot fire that rolled through here. And so it's pretty impressive that even with that, the fire went out when it hit the grazed area. So the other use of grazing as an effective tool, let's say we wanna actually build a uh, fuel break. And so this is showing an area the, the typical setup that Boise BLM has been using in Idaho on their rangelands, that basically they have a road and they're going in there and they're trying to graze it very aggressively within 200 feet of the road on either side down to two inch stubble height. And then they kind of have more of a, a graduated phase out and then the next half quarter mile from that, they're gonna have 30% you know, utilization. And then beyond that, it's gonna be more of a um, much lower utilization rate once they get lower out. And so how are they doing this? In some cases, they're trying to use fencing to really focus the grazing 200 feet next to the road. And, and fencing can be an effective tool, but depending on your operation, fencing is a high infrastructure cost to put in. If you're able to get your cows trained on using poly braid or quick electric fence so you can move around quickly, that can be a very effective tool to use. But the Boise BLM is finding that they really only have one producer that, that's able to use that as an effective tool. 
And so most of what they're doing is primarily water and supplement distribution. So where are they putting water and protein for the livestock? And so you can see here, they've got the road that they're trying to build the fuel break along. And so they've got cows on either side of that with the blue tubs for water. And the protein is also mixed in here as well. And so you can see by having the water next to the road, it really did kind of help focus livestock use closer along the road. And so that most likely that's going to be the most effective to, tool to use if you're really trying to get increased use in one area. Uh, stockmanship with herding is also a good approach. But again, that takes livestock. They're used to that approach. And it takes a lot of time on your part to actually be out there herding the animals. Uh, or you could be spending a lot of money paying for your help to be out there herding animals. And maybe there's other projects they should be working on. So I'm going to conclude here with kind of one last grazing for fire management success story, that this is a story that they were trying to graze the, the two inch double height in Idaho. They were having issues with getting it that low, but they were finding that they had a, a road kind of like this that they were driving water in to get to the, the livestock. And they had a fire that came through. Temperatures were you know 90 degrees, somewhat uh, decent wind speed, not super gusty, but enough to generate some fire behavior with the wind and extremely dry conditions. And you can see here, this is the wildfire coming towards the water haul road here, shown around the, the shrubs here. And when that fire actually hit the, the road, the grazing was so short next to the road that the fire went out on its own without even requiring fire suppression. It's a very effective um, example there of, of, of grazing working. And we're going to bump through here. I did have one example that I can uh, provide uh, link to this later for you guys to go through if you want in that online folder I can walk I'll put a, a webinar recording up there of me walking through this but basically thinking about how we can use uh, tools to figure out how much forage we have available and then trying to set stocking rates and timing of grazing to effectively reduce those fine fuels because it's easy to talk to uh, have the talk about using grazing as an effective tool, but it is much harder to actually sit down, look at a map and come up with a plan when you have multiple objectives that you're trying to do with this. Uh, you know, one important reminder too with this is that livestock are an effective tool, but you want to make sure that you're not impacting animal health as a result of grazing some of these fuels that are lower in protein content in higher non-digestible parts. Another consideration, uh, remember that we are trying to graze some of these areas short, but wildlife often uh, need to graze some of these areas. And in some areas, we can think about areas that uh, we can graze it effectively for fire, but leave a little bit of excess forage there for wildlife use at certain times of the year. Other consideration is if we're trying to graze close to infrastructure on the farm. This is just one example that, you know, sometimes that's a hindrance that we need additional fencing to protect some of our uh, infrastructure from cattle grazing in those areas. And one last thing to touch on here with resource inventory, which very small section of this webinar, but basically the idea of a resource inventory is often we have areas that we either have water in or we can put water in, but we don't necessarily have them mapped on a map for first responders to know where they're at. We need roads for access and fire breaks both. And the other confusing thing with these wildfire inventories is that we have landmarks on the landscape that we could tell first responders, yeah, meet me at uh, Winkle Butte that's right over here, when in fact that butte could have three other names on different maps. And so sometimes it's important to remember that, that we need to have common nomenclature for geographical landmarks on maps. Make sure that's clear when you're telling other producers or first responders where to meet you at, that you actually are meeting at the same spot. So just one example here, these major roads are labeled, but often these faint farm roads are not. And so maybe, you know, have those driveways or different roads, access points, have a name for those that you can actually put on a map or put on a road as a reference point can help. You can see here, there's two different points for water that would be helpful to let first responders know about. And just real briefly, often when we're doing an inventory, Put on a map your evacuation routes. Where is there? Where are there water sources that first responders could tap into? Highlight those safety zones here, shown in purple, and I believe the red section here is kind of you know a danger zone to warn people about. 
and then think about putting that information in a PVC tube like this that you can put uh, in your entrances to your operation uh, or next to your mailbox if you're more of a residential uh, rural homeowner. So thanks again. This is my wrap up my presentation here. And then as we transfer to Katie here, I'm launching a poll right now that you guys can hopefully have access to. And I appreciate you guys listening to my presentation here. There's a QR code here that will take you to a survey for me that will also get sound in an email tomorrow. And then also there's a QR code for the online folder that I referenced to. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share and let Katie take this over. All right, Katie, let you get started. I know I went over a little bit, but feel free to, we don't have to get done right at one o'clock. So if you need a couple more minutes to wrap up, that's fine. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, I'm just getting lost in my mini screen so we can see the PowerPoint here. Yes. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. I'm Katie Wolstein. I'm the Range and Fire Regional Specialist with the OSU Extension Fire Program. Uh, really grateful to be here with Jacob today. He did a great job kind of describing the usefulness of grazing and synthesizing the research that my colleagues here at the Eastern Oregon Agriculture Research Center have, um, you know, kind of generated over the years. But one thing we forget is, um, as, especially out in southeastern Oregon where I am, uh, Ranchers are operating in a multi ownership context. A lot of them heavily depend on a network of public lands alongside their private lands. And so there are unique considerations um, when you want to do grazing to mitigate fuels. And so I'm going to talk about those things with you today. Let's see if I can. There we go, a little delay there. Uh, so just briefly today, I'm gonna talk about uh, the federal policy that this conversation is couched within. Um, some logistical considerations for operators, we can't forget about those. Um, and then other considerations, I think of these more as, um, you know, kind of squishy social things. So relationships between a permittee and the agency staff, um, staff experience. Some of my research uh, has empirically shown that this, this matters in terms of trying new things on public lands. Um, and then also, you know, leadership comfortable with experimentation. Uh, I will qualify this conversation with um, each BLM district, each forest service office um, is different and unique. Um, it depends on kind of a mix of people in there and kind of the history of those regions. Um, this is a function of leadership there, um, things like lawsuits and also resource condition in the area itself. Um, so these are general things today and I'm going to multiple times say, you know, talk to your local office if you're looking for more specific information. Uh, so just a little bit of policies for today. So I'm mostly going to be talking about the Bureau of Land Management just because those are largely managed by um, our, our lower rangelands are largely managed by the BLM. And so they are statutorily required to uh, manage rangelands for multiple uses. So that's FLIPMA. Additionally, NEPA requires them to undertake some kind of environmental analysis anytime uh, they are to undertake a activity on public rangelands. And so that could be as simple as putting in a new fence if you want to do some targeted grazing. And so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, they are a federal agency, so they also <laughs> have to follow the code of federal regulations. Um, so they have grazing regs, and then they also have standards for rangeland health. And so when assessing uh, grazing that's taken place on allotment, those are the standards that must be met. And so, and then finally, there are these more localized guidances. Um, these may take place at the district level or within the field office. And so these take the form of resource management plans or land use plans, and those are for field areas. Um, there may also be internal agency guidance, um, such as instructional memorandums uh, that also must be followed. And so when, uh, if you're a rancher and you're approaching uh, your agency office about uh, changing something about grazing on your public land allotment, 
they, they do have to consider your needs within the context of all these other resource issues. So riparian, upland vegetation, soils. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind when you're making these requests that uh, likely your rangeland management specialist or your range con at the field office is likely feeling some tension. Uh, they're statutorily required to perform their job in a way that sustains rangeland resources um, and then also considers the multiple uses of rangelands, which do include non-grazing uses. And so in terms of navigating these, and again, just strictly considering grazing to mitigate fire risk, um, you have two general options. I will say you probably have other options, but for our purposes today, the first one is um, you can do it through your existing grazing permit. Um, you know, maybe you're a really lucky person and you already have a 12 month permit and you have some flexibility to shift around the season of use. Maybe AUMs remain the same, but the timing of the grazing, uh, perhaps you wanna try some dormant season grazing to take off um, kind of that buildup of fuels from the previous season. Um, so changing the timing or duration is an option. Um, and so ideally seek out opportunities to work within your existing terms and conditions. And the reason I say this is um, because, as I mentioned before, when we're talking about federal policy, when uh, a permittee is requesting a big change to their permit, the BLM or Forest Service is going to have to undertake some kind of NEPA analysis to ensure that those proposed activities um, won't have uh, adverse effects on the rangeland resource. So that takes time. I think a lot of you here probably are familiar with those processes. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, if this photo in the background, I took this um, in the Twin Falls district in Southern Idaho, uh, I'm sorry, Boise district. Uh, and so that's obviously just, you know, monoculture of Medusa head. And so um, as terrible as it might be to have your allotment looking like this, this might be an ideal scenario to try some grazing to reduce fire risk using an existing permit because this, this parcel probably isn't reaching standards anyway. It isn't providing for things like wildlife habitat. And so you might have some flexibility to change that timing or duration of grazing um, that maybe you wouldn't if this were prime sage grouse habitat. And so, you know, maybe a takeaway from this today is, is pick your battles, keeping in mind that the administrative agency is having to balance these different uses. A second option, um, which looks different depending on where you are, uh, it could be through a fuels or biological treatment authorization. And so that usually takes the form of, um, a lot of times in Oregon and Idaho, we're seeing what are called environmental assessments or environmental impact statements, which is, um, you know, the NEPA analysis has been conducted to assess whether or not these activities can be undertaken. And so often this could be written into a field area's RMP or if they use a land use plan. Um, and what it basically does is specify that to control things like weeds or fuels buildup, um, livestock grazing could be a tool that can be used. And so a little more information about each of these. Um, so I alluded to this before. If you want to do um, grazing to mitigate fire risk through your existing permit, um, if a change needs to be made, so maybe your dates need to be extended, perhaps you have an on date of March off May, you want to switch it maybe late fall to deal with um, that second emergence of, of cheatgrass, uh, you need to let your office know and, and find out is that doable and kind of what the time frame is for um, that permit renewal because your terms and conditions must be changed in order to do that. Um, find out the time period for that. Perhaps you want to change the authorized AUMs. That request would also need to um, undergo some kind of analysis. Same with class of livestock. And so this could potentially take a long time. And so you want to be in communication with your field office. And, and just find out if this is a possibility. Um, and so as I've mentioned several times now, uh, any kind of new activity on these, these parcels that aren't specified in the permit would require some kind of NEPA analysis. And so this is new fencing, uh, but this also could be a fence removal. Um, extended season of use is an obvious one. 
And then another one we don't think a ton about um, are, you know, water, new spring developments or new troughs. Uh, we know that those improve livestock distribution depending on your goals. Um, and so we've heard anecdotally that that can take a long time as well to get that kind of analysis through. As far as um, doing kind of fields treatment through um, a um, biological treatment authorization. So basically livestock in this context is the tool uh, for achieving that kind of control. And so again, getting approval for this could take a long time. And ideally this would already be written into a field areas RMP. It's just less of kind of an administrative lift for a field area. Um, and so it's also important to keep in mind that livestock aren't always the best tool to deal with fuels. And so, um, you know, think about mixing and matching um, at, a, at a landscape scale, because again, wildfires take place at these vast spatial scales. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, something that might be authorized for one allotment may not, not be possible in a different one, or um, these kinds of treatments might be authorized for an entire field area, or an entire district. Um, so one example is the Vail District over here in southeastern Oregon um, in 2015 did manage to um, kind of get a, a programmatic EA for um, what they call the integrative invasive plant management. And so what that does is authorize targeted grazing of invasive annual grasses. Um, and, and so that extended the grazing season of use on certain parcels uh, through December to allow for, you know, extra kind of removal of fuels. However, um, under these conditions, there are stipulations because we need to keep in mind that the agency must uh, make sure to continue to meet standards. And so um, for this particular scenario, uh, some of these rules were there had to be less than 50% snow cover and easily observed green grasses, annuals or blue grasses in that area. Um, and then they also were interested in protecting willows. So for this specific EA, winter grazing couldn't continue once browse utilization of the willows reached 50%. So something to keep in mind um, for these uh, situations. So logistical considerations, uh, you know, we recognize a lot of ranchers are running operations that use multiple pastures uh, that are planned out throughout the year. And so, you know, it's one thing to say, man, I wish I could graze these fuels, you know, reduce my fire risk, but we need to think about how this fits into kind of that whole operation planning. And so how often would animals need to be moved? This isn't a situation where you can kind of leave them and then come back three months later. Uh, time of year, obviously, is, is an important thing to think about. I alluded to this earlier. Um, is there water on these allotments that, that you'd wish to graze differently than you may have not previously. Supplementation, same thing. Uh, Jacob uh, touched on this right at the end of his talk. How do you make sure your livestock distribution achieves what you're looking for? Will this require new fencing? Uh, you know, do you have money or interest in having range riders out there? Uh, do you need to do something different about your water placement or, or supplement? And then, you know, kind of an obvious question, but I thought it would be important to leave here. Uh, you know, where do you go after you reach kind of that maximum utilization? Uh, just because you're grazing in maybe a different time of year than you wouldn't normally, it doesn't mean that you can't exceed, uh, sorry, it doesn't mean that you can exceed the, those maximum AUM. So you, you will need to leave and, and uh, turn out somewhere else. And then an important one that we, we don't necessarily think of immediately is kind of the predictability of this forage resource. When you are considering grazing to uh, mitigate fire risk, are, are you um, structuring your operation so that you are needing to have that grass every single year or will this just be an occasional one? Um, if so, or occasional source of forage? If so, you know, what will you be feeding cows or sheep in those years that you don't graze? And so these are, these are all just kind of complicated things we, we forget to think about sometimes. Finally, in kind of the other considerations, um, so grazing to mitigate fire risk might be viewed as a risk for the agency. And I say this because um, our public land management agencies get sued a lot. Um, and so a lot of times 
there's an aversion to sticking out your neck and trying something new, especially if it's unproven and it could potentially incur a lawsuit. So it's important to be sensitive of kind of that, that risk management aspect um, that the agencies have to keep an eye out for. I've mentioned this a couple of times now. Um, it also just takes them a lot of time to fulfill their administrative requirements. They must do certain processes to authorize certain activities. And so it's important to be patient and, and understand that this is just part of operating in a public lands context. The other thing we have to think about is um, the public land management agencies don't just serve grazing interests, right? They, they must kind of field this multitude of requests from the public. And so this includes like rights of way and trespass, um, wild horses, um, and so in summary, if your field office seems uninterested or unable to accommodate your request or enthusiastic desire to try and graze to mitigate your fire risk, um, there's a good chance that they're overloaded with the other demands. Um, and so it's difficult for them to undertake kind of those onerous administrative processes like renewing your permit to change dates um, required in order for them to allow you to try something different on your existing permits. But there's things that help. Um, so one of my studies out of Idaho found that experienced agency staff, they do know kind of how to navigate those administrative burdens and be a little more efficient about those things. It's also important to have leadership within the offices who are comfortable with experimentation. And so, like I said, trying new things, being a little more flexible, it is a risk. It's understandably a risk. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. And then I can't emphasize this enough, um, permittee agency relationships are really important. So not only, um, you know, we know permittees want their, their range con to uh, be really willing to let them try new things and experiment. Well, it goes the other way as well, right? The agency needs permittees who are trusted and have proven histories of stewardship and good management in order to kind of earn a little bit more flexibility on these public lands allotments. And then fi a final thought to leave you with, I think all of us can do a better job communicating with the public of the function of grazing and mitigating fire risk. It's just another tool on a really vast landscape that can be you know, one tool of many to help us deal with this threat. Um, and so we can do a better job talking about you know, why and when livestock can be useful. Maybe this is putting informational signs um, about why you're doing targeted grazing in maybe a highly visible place and you know why it might look a little uh, heavily used in a, in a particular year. So just some food for thought to leave you all with. Um, appreciate your time today. Um, I think we have little time for questions, but please shoot me an email uh, if you wish. And then if uh, it would help me just to you know become a better extension educator if you would provide me some feedback. So you can use that uh, QR code or I will put a link in the chat. Thank you everyone for your time today. Thanks Katie. Yeah, you can see the link in the chat there. Thank you for that great overview of, of the constraints that sometimes get in the way of, of using grazing as an effective tool for fire mitigation risk. Um, and we do have, um, if you're on the call here and you have a question, feel free to answer it. Uh, Katie and I don't have to run anywhere immediately here. And I'll just add too that Katie covers some great stuff with, with BLM, but also thinking about uh, if you're working with Natural Resource Conservation Service on a, on a project, sometimes they have prescribed grazing and other things that sometimes maybe it's not, don't be afraid to communicate with them if you wanna adapt your conservation plan to allow you to do some um, wildfire mitigation grazing in certain key areas. Uh, and just another thought for those that are on the call, if you talk to farm service agency, if you have land that's enrolled in CRP, if you have, uh, especially right now, we're in kind of emergency drought situation, so they are allowing grazing. If you talk to your FSA office, I'm not telling you to go out there and graze it now, go talk to FSA and they should be able to allow you to graze some areas that often you are not able to graze in the past right now. And also you can put in fuel breaks along CRP lands as long as you talk to your FSA office. And so I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure if putting in a fuel break would also allow you if you had an electric fence, if you could graze CRP in certain areas to create a fuel break, you might be able to do that. So just talk to folks 
with your federal programs, regardless of if it's BLM and RCS or anyone. So. And just looking at the QA, Q and A, John Rizza, the um, North Northern Oregon Fire Specialist of the OSU, did bring up a good point that grazing CRP during drought is a great way to get some acres of valuable forage um, for sure. So I won't keep everybody on here any longer if nobody else has any thoughts. But thank you very much for your time. This afternoon, Katie, thank you all for attending. And again, you'll get an email tomorrow with links for various things that we discussed today. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.